Thank you, Paul. Um, so he was right when he said, check under your seat, you get a free thing, but I'm gonna keep it till the end of the presentation. I, we do actually have a free thing for you guys tonight. And I wanna follow up with Jonathan's passion and come to the point where um, a couple of years ago, I started the passion and we built SideBuy, a company that's basically combining two of my favorite passions in the world. I love fashion, shopping, social e-commerce. Any new app that's actually selling something on your mobile, I know about it. And I've probably spent thousands of dollars just to try them because I like how they work. And my other passion is technology. Um, I started as an engineer, then moved on to be a marketer in uh, the whole software platform business. Uh, but it was really hard to figure out building something that can keep up with market trends and be social trendy, but at the same time be agile and scalable. Because we have OS uh, APIs, we have uh, mobile apps changing all the time, iOS is putting up a new version every six months, there's a new uh, screen size that comes out, um, and there's a new framework, a new code library and language. One day you've got React, one day you've got Angular, one day you've got Python, all these things that are coming. How do you build a scalable platform and not waste so much money to build something um, that's trendy and is gonna be obsolete within a few months? And that's the struggle that um, we had at SideBuy. Um, back in, a couple of years ago, we found out that blogs and influencers are trendy. That's the new trend in social marketing. McKenzie actually coined a term called influencer marketing. And that's because people actually changed the habit of buying by reading blogs. 60% of people bought something after reading about it in a blog. And about 200 million people in the US have ad blockers. So ads gone away, blogs are the new place where people shop. And blogs are on all over social media, Instagram, Pinterest, and um, we wanted to build a platform that brands and retailers and shops can actually get access to this group of influencers. So we built SideBuy, a marketplace that connects social brands, lifestyle, fashion, e-commerce, to influencers and bloggers. Bloggers are a group of people that have following on social media. And if a blogger or an influencer or celebrity wears something, people actually buy it. I knew I have to build three things. A campaign management dashboard, I had to build a database that's gonna have all these bloggers' information in it, and I also wanted to build an analytics platform with it. You can see how difficult it's gonna get and how complex building all these three can get, not knowing what type of features you're gonna put into it. I didn't know how many features, what kind of APIs, what tech stack, what coding language, none of that. So, some of the learnings through it, I'm gonna share three tips with you that came out of this whole exercise. Um, stay true to your vision and to your customer. Talk with your customer, ask them something. And, and you know what, as a founder, you always have a vision. You have this picture of what you want your product to be, but have that conversation with your customer. And even if they say your vision sucks, Take it, it's okay, you can reiterate on it. Build an MVP, build the minimum that you can that's absolutely valuable to your customer and don't sway around with a new trend. There is a new social platform coming on, one day it's Periscope, one day it's Snapchat, one day it's Vine, one day it's Twitter. How do you keep up? As a, a company with resources that are limited, are you gonna integrate to every single API of a newest social network that's out there? No. Be picky and prioritize. After you put the MVP out, don't even build one line of code um, until you A-B test. Once you A-B test, then yes, maybe Periscope is the next thing. Maybe Snapchat is something that your customers and your users are finding valuable and actually integrate that one in. And stay true to, to your customers. Be very honest about what you can build and maintain, especially in this world where You've got a new Nexus uh, tablet coming out that's different size. Samsung Galaxy is putting out all sorts of different screen sizes. Make a list of the operating systems and browsers and mobile devices. And also, again, a lot of the applications are given, um, uh, it's a given now that they have to work even on smart TVs, on wearables. So how do you keep track of all the multiple screen sizes and operating systems that your application needs to work on? Make a list. Stay true to it, 
and communicated with your customers. And by that, I mean communicated with, um, within an FAQ or even actually let your customer service people know because that's the first line of um, um, kind of the front line where customers are actually going to come to. And they can say, you know what, guys, we don't support Chrome on iOS 6. Sorry, be transparent about that. Um, and also the other thing, definitely communicate this, not only obviously your developers, your designers, your QA, but communicate it with your marketing team and group because they can be the champion of your next newest version of your iOS or your next newest version of your Android app that you just spend quite a bit of development time, maybe six sprints, to fix one bug because Android had an update too. So you want the whole organization to know about it so they can champion that if that work has been done. My favorite one is pros and cons of build versus buy. Often I see technologists are very biased towards building because we always think, myself, I think I'm going to build it better and cheaper and faster than anybody else. Um, however, on the C-suite side, a lot of the management are to biased towards actually buying something because they want to integrate with enterprise platforms. Make a list, don't take this lightly, include everyone on the team, include the marketing people, include your developers, include your QA, and make that pros and cons list. A couple of um, rules of thumbs that I use, if a company that's bigger than you and has more resources, has already built it, for instance, Google or Apple, don't rebuild it. So for instance, for our analytics platform, obviously no one can beat Google Analytics. So we just integrate it into Google Analytics. But if it's a feature that's going to differentiate you or actually put you on the cutting edge, that would be your competitive advantage, then build it yourself. And for us at Sidebuy, it was the blogger's demographic and profile, kind of seeing the audience, seeing what they do, actually knowing their reach on social media, all of that great stuff was the competitive advantage, so we spent time building it. Last one, code with what you know, so, and you can afford, money-wise. We started building our stack on Ruby on Rails, then this is about a year ago, and Scala, Scala came about. We're like, this is the newest and greatest things. So we started dabbing into Scala only to find out that there's no way we can afford Scala developers in this city <laughs> because, as we know, some of the top companies in the city are actually hiring Scala developers and they're very expensive. Um, actually, by the way, side note, I was one of the people that raised my hand. We're hiring developers. <laughs> Ruby and React, as you see, are last ones. Um, so definitely choose based on the talent pool that's available in your area and how much you can spend, obviously. And also look at the community, the size of the community. Are there meetups? Are there people there that you can get help from and resources from? Um, on the front end side, we went from Angular to React. I think we're one of the very few shops as well in the city that's doing React on the front end. I'm happy to discuss why we made that decision. Would love to hear you guys' uh, feedback on that as well. But I'm, I'm personally, I'm loving the framework. I'm actually quite loving it. You know, decision, there was a lot of hard decisions to be made, but uh, after making all of those decisions, at the end of the day, the, today we have 10,000 bloggers across 150 cities in North America and UK, and we have a reach, we control the reach of 500 million audiences on social media. Ask me questions. Absolutely, actually, yeah. So he asked, you talked about Google API, did you consider Cloud? Yes, actually, we, we integrated into Cloud. Cloud is a very simple API, it's very quick, probably took two hours of integration, but it's great because it gives a sort of a, as you know, influence score. We don't use it straight up, we use it within a formula that we put in, sort of a side by index, so we use Cloud as one of the measures of the engagement of a blogger and their reach. So it's one metric, yes.
Absolutely. It's a chicken and egg, as you mentioned. So just repeating the question if you haven't heard. Marketplaces, how do you um, fill up the two sides of the marketplace and how do you decide which side? Um, so to tell you the truth, we started with the bloggers because the va so to, in, in any case, uh, value proposition and figuring out that value proposition for either side is important and then figuring out the cost of acquisition for either side and the one that's cheaper, start with that. With a small company with small resources, that's what you got to do. So in our case, it was bloggers because this is a given for them. We're basically providing a platform for them that empowers them. They can see analytics about their audience. They get to know their audience better so they can create a content that resonates with it better. And it's kind of free for bloggers. So it's sort of a job platform for them where they come and sign up and they wait for brands to work with them. So we filled that one up first. And obviously, cost of acquisition of clients and brands was higher. So cost was one of the factors of decision making. But also, the other factor would be features. Which side of the marketplace is lighter on features? So if the feature set is lighter, and you've created the sign up form, that's one, two, three step, it's easier to maintain, fill up that side, just generally because again, it's all about resources and prioritization when you're running a lean company. Does that help? When you say light on the features, you don't mean it has less intrinsic value uh, for that group. Excellent question. Thank you. When I say light, yes, I have to clarify. I say light in the complexity of coding. So how much time it's going to take you to code it, what type of skill sets and whatnot. Yes, you're right. So not light on the value proposition, because remember, you built an MVP, you asked your customer and built that one feature that's going to add the most absolute value for that customer, but from a com complexity standpoint. Does that make sense? Yeah. I got a question about trends and technology. Yes. And it's like with chatbots right now. Um, what role do you think they have on your platform and do you think they're here to stay? Chatbots. Um, well, they're here, mm, it's hard to tell if they're here to stay. I think they're here to stay for another year or so. The usage on it is obviously heading up. It's going up quite a bit. Um, for us, I guess, one of the things that, you know, uh, we, we've had people that want to do Snapchat, they want to do Slack, they even want to do a lot of real-time work. Um, but one of my problems with one, you know, integrating that type of chats and also real time is, for me, uh, in measurements and analytics. Because at the end of the day, and also ripple effect. Sometimes you don't get the ripple effect of having a post or a, a long form content. A blog is a long form content. So you don't get that ripple effect specifically with chatbots. And you don't get the call to action. It's, it's very hit and miss. Now, the other problem with it is, um, brands are very worried about the followers um, of these influencers to be fake. Because as you know, there's all these things where you can buy a ton of fake followers and whatnot. So through the platform, we have to actually run an analysis to make sure if you're living in San Francisco, but half of your followers are in India, you have 200,000 followers on Instagram, 100,000 of them are in India or China, there must be something wrong. So uh, I feel that chatbots are hard to measure and actually verify. So that's why, yeah. But you know what? Again, they're trendy, super trendy. It, what does the customer want? I don't know yet. We haven't, uh, we haven't really tested it yet.